I'm not sure if you've noticed it, but the recent stock market rally has almost been entirely driven by. Since seven, seeing nice gains following Q4 earnings. Has so much more room to run. And others you look say at the long term chart, Frank. Far. This is your classic definition of a parabolic chart. We've been on a nice little run here, Jay. I mean, the figures these companies are delivering are insane. It does beg the question should we just invest in the Magnificent Seven? Okay, so to recap, the so called Magnificent Seven are the US tech encompassing Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Meta, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and Tesla. In 2023, the MAG-7 accounted for roughly 77% of the S&P 500's advance. The S&P 500 for the year was up 23%. They have been so dominant, the MAG-7 are now over 30% of the S&P 500. But is this just another bubble? Like, we've been here before. The dot-com bubble was a stock market bubble that ballooned during the late 1990s and peaked and February, March the 10th, 2000. Tech stocks had soared based on future potential, not actual profits. A great example of style, but no substance. Inflated expectations, and then... Investors realized promises weren't panning out, leading to a huge sell-off. The Nasdaq pretty much melted, heavily relying on tech, and plummeted 70% at the time. The negative sentiment resulted in dragging down the S&P 500, who struggled to regain the pre-bubble levels. It became known the lost decade for US stocks. Okay, full disclosure here, because I'm a finance loser, I do have some small amount of individual stock holdings, and one of them is in the Magnificent Seven. And this, to be clear, is far from a recommendation. It's actually a warning sign. It sits in what I call my money pit. Do you have a money pit too? I actually think if you enjoy it and it keeps you engaged, then there is some space for having a money pit. Here are the rules for my money pit. Never more than 10 to 15% of my investable assets. It's a bit of fun and you know, life is short. So what could be more fun than finding out after over a long and slow painful time that you in fact not smarter than the market? You are the next Warren Buffett. Forget, Forget the, data. the data, you are, you are special. special. The market, the market is, not is not efficient and you'll, and you'll be, able be able to beat, to beat it, it from your bedroom. bedroom. So why don't you tell me in the comments, what's in your money pit? So with the performance of these stocks being so sublime recently, should we be just investing in the Magnificent Seven? And because of regulation, and because I'm, by nature, I'm gonna to have to sort of refer to some individual stock positions here because there's only seven of them. Instead of me giving any of my opinions, I'm gonna bring two people in for the debate so you can choose your own adventure and find out who you believe. So we've got two people here. We've got Tech Bro Chad. He is a coder, SPAC investor, and he's gonna tell you all the reasons why this time the market is justifying the price of these companies. And this is gonna continue. Anyway, the second person I'm gonna bring in is Professor Priced In. He believes that valuations do matter, that we should always be wary when valuations get high and that inevitably based on current valuations, we are gonna see a big pullback in these tech companies. These two are gonna battle out for your opinion and you can decide who wins. Bro. Yeah, bro. I can't do accents. No, we're gonna do accents. Okay, so the thing the old school investors like your value professor neglects to mention is the shift that we're seeing in the companies that are like asset light companies, as in old valuation metrics are based on the old economy where you have to make, buy and sell things. And it's a completely different way to how these tech companies are operating now. If you can order and fulfill your product based on a click, which is how Alphabet derive their earnings, which is effectively ad revenue, or Meta do very similar, then it's gonna translate into one thing, big, epic margins. You've just got an ecosystem of products which has huge moats and customer loyalties. So I know there are some valuation skeptics out there, so let's just tackle some of the figures. Look at Apple's Q1 2024 income statements. Apple had net profit of 34 billion. Google had net profit of 19.7 billion. Nvidia recently showed a 55.58% profit margin. Margin, that is crazy. So yes, tech companies are valued highly, but for good reason. They do nothing to break a valuation framework, they only reinforce it. If, for investors, a company has a significant moat, then investors are willing to invest at a lower cost of capital, which means that every one pound of profits from these companies should be valued higher. So what this reinforces is what Eugene Farmer would say, which is that the market is efficiently pricing in how valuable these companies are. So, Professor Priced In, how exactly can something be priced in, like an efficient market, yet be overvalued? And I know he's gonna mention about dot-com bubble this and forward valuation that, 
But the bottom line is that there are very limited levels of similarities. Yes, the Magnificent 7 make up about 30% of the S&P 500. But if we compare the biggest seven tech companies today versus the dot-com bubble, the earnings as a proportion of the S&P 500 are much higher. Simply put, these tech firms are valued for good reasons based on the profits they're producing. That's even before we start going into what companies like Meta were able to do with their earnings on their last earnings call. So for those that didn't know, Meta laid off more than 20,000 workers in 2023 as part of what Zuckerberg called a year of efficiency. That was 20% of their workforce. Yet, despite that, they recently were able to increase revenues by 25%. This is at the heart of what we have to understand in the exceptional element of these tech businesses. Yeah, I get it. In the past, some companies were brought down by competition, but... Have you ever heard of a company in one year cut their workforce by 20% and increase their revenue by 25%? Frankly, if most companies came out and said they'd cut 20% of their workforce, you think they were about to go out of business. It speaks to the asset-like business model we're now facing. And only now am I gonna mention the elephant in the room, AI. Are we looking at a new technological revolution, which is gonna be the biggest change the world has ever seen over the shortest period of time? Who do you think are gonna be the winners? Clearly, it's going to be those huge tech companies who have access to the most computing power, who maybe have insane levels of cash on their balance sheet that they can deploy. And we need to understand the, the size of these companies and the cash they could deploy. The market cap of BP, British Petroleum, is $79 billion. NVIDIA, on the 22nd of February, in a single day, gained $277 billion. That is three times the market cap of BP in a single day gain. My case is that these companies are valued highly for good reason. They have significant moats, which are likely to sustain because of the new technological revolution we're gonna see. And those who underweight them could end up just going into old value stocks, which are gonna to continue to underperform. A very risky place to be. That's all I need to cover, bro. Two. Okay, thank you, young man. That was uh, that was enthusiastic. But I, I think you've misunderstood the question. The question was, I think you'll find, should you just invest in these companies? No one is saying these are not good companies. These are great companies at the top of the market delivering incredible results. The question is, should we invest in them now and in just these companies? And here, I think you're missing some key points. NVIDIA's stock trades at nearly 100 times its trailing earnings. Even if you base it on the company's estimated future profits, the multiple is still very high, around 36. That means a 2.77% return based on the price of the stock for every pound of earnings. The thing is, investing at some of these valuations is like picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. No one is saying that these weren't incredible investments. You are using past performance of the stock to justify its future. And these stocks just happen to be priced to perfection. There is nothing new when these type of things happen. Nvidia could be the next Amazon and fulfill investors' growth expectations. Or it could be like the dozens of companies that came to prominence in the 80s but didn't last to the new millennium. In 1982, Commodore International sold the second most popular personal computer, the Commodore 64. At the beginning of 85, it had lost its competitive edge and the stock price had gone from 100 to less than 20. Less than a decade later, the company was bankrupt. You mentioned AI. Well, people used to say PCs were gonna take over the world. They were right. But what they were wrong about was that all the companies that were making the PCs in the 80s didn't actually make it. So, Chad, do you honestly know that you can pick the next Amazon and not Commodore? And there was something very interesting you mentioned away about how dominant companies were. And that, I don't think you realise what you said. So let's have a look at some of the biggest names from the past who were dominant in the previous decades. How many are huge companies now? Let's go over some names. Chevron, IBM. General Motors, who I believe filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Let's now talk about one of the biggest companies, because I think this is key to the argument as well. In 1982, the United States versus AT&T was a huge antitrust case, which is in the UK is more known about being anti-monopoly regulations. And it led in 1982 to the, what was called the Bell System divestiture. This is the breakup of the old companies. This is already happening with tech. In 2023, the US Federal Trade Commission and 17 state attorneys sued Amazon, claiming the tech companies used anti-competitive and unfair strategies to maintain a position of dominance in the market. The lawsuits against Google, Meta, and Amazon remain ongoing. What I'm making is, it is very hard to maintain dominance in any market 
because competition of antitrust or anti-monopoly regulation often steps in. So if you are just investing in these companies, this is a huge risk to be aware of. You've also made some huge assumptions that these big companies will be unlike most big companies before them. They will nail the position on the next generation of AI. And yes, they might take the market, but generally incumbents aren't typically the winners of the next technological wave. We've already seen significant pushback in relation to Google's Gemini's launch and issues in relation to their large language model. And when I was using this to write the script to have jokes about tech bros, it told me that tech bros was an offensive term and it came back saying it couldn't possibly provide offensive generalizations about groups of people. This wokest large language model just shows how difficult it is to stay on top of a new market. Data backs this up as well. The below shows the annualized return of what the market delivered for these for stocks once they joined the largest 10 stocks, all the way from 1927 to 2019. So not a short period of time. So what they showed is the three years after they joined the top 10 is normally above market returns by 0.7, but five years are minus 1.1 and 10 years minus 1.5, as in they trailed the average market return. This is just a great example of competition, bloat, and in any market, it's really hard to stay on top for a long period of time. Hype trains come and go, but people don't change. So when you are betting on individual stocks, Magnificent 7 or not, you're taking a bet that unlike a diversified investment where you say, I believe the general market will push forward, you're saying specifically, I think these companies will continue to dominate. And when they get as highly valued as they are now, the market tends to bring them down. That's not to say there might not be more space to run, but it's not about how good a company is and what it delivers, which determines your investment return. It's about what the company delivers compared to what's already priced in. All right, so they were the arguments from both characters. I need you to settle the debate. Who do you believe? Let me know in the comments, as well as what's in your money pit?